Hey y'all, you're listening to It's Been a Minute from NPR. I'm Brittany Luce. My guest today is Virginia Soul Smith. She's an author, writer, and host of the Burnt Toast newsletter and podcast, and her work focuses on rethinking how we feed our families. Virginia has noticed an emerging predicament from parents. They want their children to have healthy relationships to food and their bodies, but they don't want their kids to get fat. It's a huge anxiety, but she says this dilemma is fundamentally flawed. Those of us who survived the 90s and the 2000s, we know what diet culture did to us as teenagers. We don't want to repeat those cycles, but we're not really sure what else to do because we haven't reckoned with the underlying issue, which is anti-fat bias. And so unless we divest from that, we're always putting these guardrails around who gets to have a good relationship with food and with their bodies. Her latest book called Fat Talk is all about how we need to rethink our ideas about fatness. It's a deeply researched look at why it's completely okay for children to be fat. And even if you don't have kids, there's plenty in it for you. All right, here's my chat with Virginia. Virginia, welcome to It's Been a Minute. Thank you. I am thrilled to be here. A lot of your work is built on the thesis that it is okay and normal for children to be fat. Yes. And this is not a small thing. Like, it's a really tough idea for a lot of people to grasp because fat phobia is so ingrained in our society. Why is it important for people, especially caregivers, to internalize that idea that it is okay and normal for children to be fat? For a couple of reasons. I mean, number one, because it's true because human diversity is a great thing. Bodies have always come in different shapes and sizes. And the relationship between weight and health is not as one-to-one as we've been led to believe it is. So it is very possible for a kid to be healthy and growing well and just in a bigger body, in a fat body, and that is great. Mm -hmm. And we need to stop pathologizing that because when we pathologize that, kids internalize the idea that their body is a problem to be solved. Hmm. And so the rest of the world is going to give your fat kid this message, right? Like that is the reality for fat kids in the world. We think we want to protect our kids from that, right? We want to keep them safe. But too often our decision is, well, I'll keep them safe if I can prevent them from being fat or make them less fat now. If I can control their body size, I will keep them safe from all of this. And that is a losing proposition. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, you also break down in your book, so much research that shows that it's not inherently unhealthy to be fat. As you say, a high body weight is not a disease. Can you break down some of the studies and research that show that to be the case? Sure. And I do want to say just off the top before we get into all that is Mm -hmm. there are folks in bigger bodies who are unhealthy. And we also need to stop making health a criteria for body acceptance. Like you can be unhealthy and you are still allowed to feel safe in your body. You should still have mm. access to the world in the same way that anyone, any quote, healthy person does. So there's a way in which health has become a matter of privilege in our country. And I think that's very much tied into all of what we're talking about here. But yes, it is also true that we do not have data demonstrating a causal relationship between body size and poor health outcomes. We have a lot of what's called weight-linked conditions, things like heart disease, diabetes, high cholesterol. It's a premise we're not questioning that the more you weigh, the more likely you are to get these diseases. But what the research really shows is a correlation between these two things. It doesn't show that the high body weight itself causes those diseases. So what we really need to do is dig into, like, what else is going on? Maybe there's some underlying issues that is both causing folks to be in bigger bodies and increasing rates of diseases. There may be a link here, but that doesn't mean that the weight causes the health problem. Right. As you note, you know, in in your book, a lot of scientists are careful to state the difference between causation and correlation in so many other types of research having to do with health and bodies. But that's not the case when it comes to studies around weight and dieting. No, it's not because there's so much money to be made in selling weight loss. And I think we can see this with weight loss drugs right now. We can see this in conversations around bariatric surgery. These are incredibly profitable industries. And yet we also know that intentional weight loss has the highest failure rate of almost any medical intervention. 
So you would not take a medication with an 80% failure rate, but that is the failure rate of intentional dieting to lose weight. We see that folks will lose some weight in the short term, and then within the next two to five years, they will regain it and usually regain it plus. And so the other piece of this weight health conversation is even if it was the weight that caused the health problems, Mm -hmm. as opposed to some other underlying issues that we don't totally understand, even if it was the weight causing the health issues, we don't have a safe and effective way for most people to lose weight and keep it off Mm -hmm. in the long term. That's true. So that's not really a useful path in terms of promoting people's health. And we do know that a risk of future eating disorders is dieting experiences. You talk in the book about how you can't control the reverberations that come from intervening in how your child eats. Like you interviewed children who responded to restrictions by sneaking food mm-hmm. and by binging or on the flip side, reacting to diets or, you know, quote unquote meal plans by developing an eating disorder. Yeah. And you don't know and you can't tell from your child's body size. I want to be really clear how your child will respond to restriction. I would say the most common response I hear about from readers, from parents is, well, now I'm finding the bag of cookies in their room. Parents Mm -hmm. perceive it as overeating and binging and sneaking food. And what it really is, is a response to restriction. And I think anyone who's been around a child understands the more you (laughs) forbid things, the more your child wants them. The other option is some kids will respond to your restriction with more and more restriction. And this isn't necessarily a conscious choice. There's Mm -hmm. a thing that happens called energy imbalance, where if a child is not taking in enough energy to support their body throughout the day, Mm -hmm. they will then be pushed into this negative energy imbalance where they're not getting enough. And that alone can trigger a restrictive eating disorder in folks who are predisposed to do that. And again, it's really important to say that can happen to kids in all body sizes. And all too often when it happens to fat kids, they are congratulated because they're finally, you know, quote, being good or being healthy. Maybe they're losing weight and that makes everyone really happy. And what you've actually just done is reinforce a deadly eating disorder. I don't think there's a caregiver out there who wants those things for their child. but Absolutely not, yeah. (laughs) I think a lot of people will really have trouble with your ideas around how there are no bad foods for kids. Many people out there are going to struggle with that. What would you say to them? I mean, fundamentally what parents are saying when they say, no, 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 there are bad foods and I shouldn't let my kids have these foods, is they're saying... I don't believe you because I've never experienced freedom around these foods. I don't trust myself around these foods. And so it is both the bias against foods, against processed foods, against whatever is on their list of, quote, bad foods. Mm -hmm. And it's also the anti-fat bias that they may or may not be willing to name. Because when you peel back, okay, but why are you concerned about their sugar intake? But why are you concerned about their processed food intake? We always get back to, I don't want them to be fat. And so this is a real paradigm shift that I am arguing for where I say we have to let go of that fear. I think sometimes talking about the fundamental shift doesn't work, though, because it's so big. It's so big to say, like, you have to stop being afraid of that. What sometimes seems to land better is to understand that restriction will backfire. Coming up, Virginia on why foods like Cheetos and Oreos might have a healthy place in our diets. Stick around. I, I feel like another another reason, though, why it, it might be so hard for the caregivers to make this leap is like the nutrition factor. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of parents, a lot of caregivers worry about nutrition. I f- feel like it's not table shaking to say that Cheetos are not <laughs> highly nutritious food. <laughs> I would be like, that's like shaking the table to say that. Yeah. But I can still hear listeners saying, well, if my child eats Cheetos or Oreos every day or something like that, or if they have access to these foods that are not necessarily nutritionally dense, this is going to negatively impact their health. What about that thought? So the first thing we have to do is back up and say, when we define what makes a healthy food, How much Mm -hmm. privilege are we using to define that? Because if you're a single mom who's working three jobs and needs to get dinner on the table, the Mm -hmm. McDonald's drive-through dollar menu is a healthy choice for you, right? You can afford it. You can get food quickly. You can feed your family. That's a win. Mm -hmm. That's a healthy dinner because it's healthier than not being able to feed them. And it's healthier Mm -hmm. than you making yourself miserable trying to cook some from scratch meal that you don't have time or the budget to do. 
You know, when my older daughter had a pediatric feeding disorder and we were working night and day to help her learn to become an oral eater again, I resisted giving her chocolate milk because I thought it would be unhealthy. This is where I was with it, right? I had a Mm. two-year-old who couldn't drink by mouth and I thought, no, no, I can't be a bad mom and give her chocolate milk. Actually, chocolate milk was the healthiest option for her because it tasted good and it gave her a reason to want to work on her drinking skills as a two-year-old. And guess what? As an almost 10-year-old, she likes chocolate milk fine, but she drinks regular milk very happily. She drinks water very happily. Like it's not, (laughs) she didn't become a chocolate milk fiend because I let her have it as a one and a half year old. She, it was useful to us at that time. So I think it's really important to say like even the quote unhealthy foods, even Cheetos, like lots of feeding therapists will tell you about the therapeutic value of Cheetos. They're a great learning food for kids who are struggling with Mm. all kinds of motor challenges around eating. So even the foods we consider super unhealthy often have a place in our lives that I would define as healthy. If they're helping you feed your family, if they're helping a cautious eater feel safe in the cafeteria because they can count on Uncrustables are always on the menu and that's a thing they Mm. eat and they can get lunch that day. A kid eating lunch is always healthier than a kid not eating lunch. Mm. So there's that big picture shift we need to make. We need to really redefine how we think about healthy eating and how much emphasis we put on nutrition. And then in terms of, okay, what do I do with this at home? Let's say budget is not a concern. Let's say you are someone who likes to cook at least, you know, half the week. You like vegetables. You enjoy eating them. You want your child to enjoy eating vegetables. The solution is to have vegetables and not make a fuss over the vegetables being so super great, not make eating them contingent on eating the other foods, and just have Mm. those foods around alongside the foods your kid likes. So when you say like not contingent on eating the other foods, like if you want dessert, if you want ice cream, if you want a cookie. Yeah, you don't earn it. to eat your spinach. You don't have to earn it. No. Hmm. Because when we do that, there's a really good study that was done in the early 2000s by a researcher named Leanne Birch, where they told kids, they told half the kids in the group, you have to finish your soup. And they told the other kids, you don't have to finish your soup. You can eat as much soup as you want. Mm-hmm. The kids who didn't have to finish their soup ate more soup and liked it more than the kids who hmm. were forced to finish their soup. There are many parents who say that they don't want their kids to deal with the same treatment they've dealt with um, or, you know, they've seen other fat people deal with. But that's not the only social reason why caretakers are so concerned with making sure their kids aren't fat. As you noted in your book, there are real consequences parents might face just by having a fat child. What are some of the ways that parents are held responsible for their kids' bodies? Well, the worst case scenario, and we don't talk about it enough, but it is happening, is that a kid's high body weight is often held against parents in custody disputes, whether that's with another parent or caregiver or Mm. in situations where CPS is called in, high body weight and the amount of junk food in the house will be listed among the list of reasons why a parent's losing parental rights. You you shared a specific story about that in your book of Anna Marie Regino. Yes, Anna Marie Regino made headlines in the early 2000s when her parents lost custody of her at the age of three because of her body size. And it really blew up as this national story. I mean, she really became a kind of patient zero for the war on childhood obesity. Because I think there were a lot of people who looked at that situation and said, well, they can't be good parents if their child is this big at three years old. This is so dangerous. And there was also a lot of coded racism and classism involved in that. So the way that story played out really showed how much we hold a child's weight against their parents. The fact was these were incredibly loving, caring parents who had been advocating for their daughter's medical care for years, not being taken seriously. And for them to lose custody of her was this huge trauma for the whole family and particularly for the child and really should never have happened. If you want to talk about kids' health, keeping families intact is a good way to promote their health, you know? Right, right. It also feels like, I mean, the pressure for parents to have thin children is like the pressure for parents to have children who are good students. Exactly. You talk a bit about how anti-fat bias hurts fat children for many reasons um, in your book, but you also point out that it harms thin children as well who internalize those lessons about what it means to be fat. I was a thin child and it's a specific experience. Yes. Can you explain a bit more about how anti-fatness hurts thin children as well, you know, possibly even sharing your own experiences. Yeah, this is my story. I was a thin kid 
until I went to college. You know, I never received negative messages about my body size. The fact that I was really unathletic, like really unathletic, I can't underscore that enough, was just sort of like a joke. People were like, oh, it's so funny. She just loves to read more than, you know, like don't throw a ball at yeah. her. She won't catch it. You know, no one said like, but we need you to be more active because you need to lose weight. So I didn't experience it directly. But what I did experience was this awareness that my body size was something that particularly a lot of the adults around me were aspiring to which just like take a minute wow. and think like how messed wow. up it is that adults are aspiring to a child's body. Like we are not supposed to have children's bodies. So then fast forward to college, I gained the quote, you know, freshman 15, whatever I gained <laughs> that people talk about. And, you know, now looking back, there's a reason that the, the pediatric growth charts continue on to age 21. Like I may have reached my adult height in ninth grade, but I hadn't right. reached my adult body, right? My adult body was still growing and shifting throughout my teenage years. Mm -hmm. So again, we demonize this weight gain that kids experience in college. It might just be you weren't done growing. You know, this is just like part of you morphing into your adult body. Mm -hmm. And it's not a shock. The women I'm related to are all you know, what I would, what I call small fat, meaning we're on the lower end of the plus size spectrum. Mm -hmm. It is a surprise to literally no one that I am a small fat adult. Um, the message was this was a failure. You know, I, I experienced mm. it as a failure. And so mm. the reason it's so important to talk to thin kids about these issues is number one, they're not all going to be thin adults. Bodies right. change. And this is normal and healthy and okay. And what we need to really do is start talking to kids much, much earlier about how normal it is for bodies to change. So this is a given. This is not a failure. This is not anything you did wrong. This is part of growing up, part of growing into your adult self. And even as an adult, your body will continue to change if we're lucky and we all get to still be here, right? <laughs> like that's, right. that's right. aging. And yet all of the messages we have around body changes, think about the messages around postpartum bodies and needing to bounce back. They're all perceived Ooh. as failure, failure, failure if you don't fight them at every step of the way. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's thing one. Thing two is even thin kids who are going to be thin adults. You know, my husband was a thin kid. He's, a thin, he's just going to be thin his whole life. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. He needs to not be a jerk to fat people, right? <laughs> Like, <laughs> very good point. He needs to know about these issues. Like, we want, you know, just like as a parent of white kids, I think a lot about how do I talk to my kids about racism? Because mm -hmm. when white parents don't do this, we raise racists. I want my thin daughters, even if they don't end up as fat adults, to right. not be anti fat, to be an ally in all of this. You've laid out a complex set of, of problems that a lot of children and families are dealing with right now. But one of the solutions that you pose to wading through all this anti-fatness and anti-fat bias is by having a fat talk or a series of fat talks with children, with other adults in your child's life, like teachers, relatives, grandparents, coaches, and also a fat talk with yourself, mm -hmm. with oneself. What is a fat talk? What is the fat talk? And, and what are some of your, your tips on, on how to navigate those conversations? Well, it's funny because fat talk is actually a term used by body image researchers, and it's a sort mm -hmm. of inherently stigmatizing term because they use it to describe the way people, and especially women, engage in this automatic, like, I hate my thighs. You hate your thighs are great, but look at my stomach, like that body shaming, sort of collective body shaming we do. And so what I'm arguing for is a new kind of fat talk. Lots of bodies are fat, and that is the way the world is, and that's great. And if we can start to do that, we can then start to name and navigate all the times when anti-fat bias shows up. So this can be talking about weight at the pediatrician's office. This can mm. be if your school has a lot of, which a lot of schools do, about half of the states in the country regularly weigh and measure kids and collect their mm -hmm. BMI. Um, or if your child's like ninth grade health class has an assignment to track calories for two weeks, which a lot of schools have as a default part of their health cur curriculum, mm -hmm. and we're all navigating um, and <laughs> figuring out how to navigate those moments in a way that keeps your child's bodily safety f like first and foremost. Hmm. There's a thought that you share in the book that's basically like you have an opportunity as a caregiver to teach your child that you can be that like line of defense for them, that safe yeah. place 
for them. Exactly. When you have these conversations. Yeah. I mean, like, let's take the pediatrician's office. It's, you know, the common protocol is your child's going to be put on the scale. They're going to calculate their BMI. And a standard part of the well child visit is talking about where they fall on the growth chart and whether that's good or bad and what you need to be doing about it. Mm -hmm. It's not a helpful conversation for kids to hear. It's not to say you never need to know your child's weight. Like you have to put them in a car seat. You have to dose their Tylenol. Like you may need that information, but it doesn't need to be a stigmatizing conversation in front of your child. Mm -hmm. And so your first step there is to request that your pediatrician not talk about BMI in front of your child. And you can hand over a post-it note at the start of the visit. You can send an email. You can just ask them directly when it comes up, whatever feels comfortable for you. A lot of doctors are saying to me, I'm so glad when parents say that, you know, this isn't where I want to go with the visit either. I want to do things differently. And so a lot of doctors are going to be super receptive to that. And so even after you've made the request, the doctor may still engage in weight talk in a really stigmatizing way around your child. The number of people I have interviewed about their eating disorders who tell me a moment of origin was the comment their pediatrician made when they were 10 years old, when they grabbed their belly, when they said it's time to switch to skim milk. Like these comments can really land. So it is something to be concerned about. But in all of those interviews, the reason the comment was as problematic as it was is because the caregiver in the room didn't say anything to combat it. So if instead, as the caregiver, we can say something like, you know what, I'm not really worried about that. I trust their body. I know they're growing well. Or, thank you, but that's not something we're going to look into at this time. That doesn't feel safe or evidence-based for us. If you can advocate for your child, then no matter what the doctor said, the child cares more about what you think, right? They see the doctor twice a year. They see you every day. So you have an opportunity there to let them know, like, this isn't, this isn't something I'm going to stand for. I will advocate for you. And if necessary, you know, debrief with your kid afterwards. How do they make you feel? Here's what I think is going on with the doctor, you know, but bottom line, we never expect you to shrink yourself. That is not something we're ever going to ask you to do. Virginia, thank you so much for coming on and talking with me today. This blew my mind. Thank you. It was a thrill to be here. Thanks again to Virginia Soul Smith. Her book, Fat Talk, is out now, and you can find her work at the Burnt Toast newsletter and podcast. Have you signed up for It's Been a Minute Plus yet? Becoming a Plus subscriber is a great way to support the work we're doing here at NPR. And you'll get to listen to this show without any sponsor breaks. So head on over to plus.npr.org slash it's been a minute to find out more. This episode of It's Been a Minute was produced by Liam McBain. Our editor is Jessica Placek. We have fact-checking help from Greta Pittinger. Our executive producer is Verilyn Williams. Our VP of Programming is Yolanda Sanguini. Our Senior VP of Programming is Anya Grundman. All right, that's all for this episode of It's Been a Minute from NPR. I'm Brittany Luce. Talk soon.